throughout his entire life. Um, and towards the end, you can you have a chance to ask some questions. The pressure's on. We have to told him that this is the most inquisitive, best question group of the morning. So the question is on, or the pressure's on to ask some questions when we get to that point. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Lincoln. Thank you, instructor, students. I am honored and feel privileged that I could be here today. My life begins 1809, Hodgsonville, Kentucky. Born to Tom and Nancy Hanks. Time when we, he decides we're going to move. So we're walking, forging streams, going through woods and snow. Well, when we arrive, we have no place to stay. My father and I, we build a three-sided lean-to, which is what we lived in until we had the log cabin built. It wasn't very big. Well, nine years of age now, my mother passes away of the milk sick. Cows would eat a certain weed and it would turn the milk sour, poisonous light. And she passes away. Sad me. Well, after a short while, Father leaves my sister and I home alone. Seems like it was gone a month or so. But when he returns, we have a new stepmother, Sarah Bush Johnson. Her husband passed away. Father knew her previously, from years ago. She has four daughters that moved up with her. So I'm helping Father clear the land and plant gardens, and it teaches me how to raise livestock, butcher, smoke meat, everything a young lad needs to know to live. Well, in two years' time, I didn't even have one year's worth of schooling, and sometimes the, the classes were taught people my own age or younger. I did learn how to read a little bit. My stepmother seen how I'd like to read and study. She was very educated, so she taught me at home. Read, I'd love to read. I remember one day I walked 20 miles to a neighbor's house to borrow a book. And one evening I set it up on the ledge. Now mind you, books are very, very expensive and very hard to come by. Well, it started raining that night. I didn't know it. That book got wet. I done everything I could to totally dry that book out. I couldn't get it done. The book was destroyed. What am I going to do now? Well, there's only one thing I can do, and I took that back to the man and explained to him what has happened. I says, I can't afford to pay you for it. I have no money. He says, well, you can work for me for a month. So that's what I did. I used to split right off logs for rail fencing to help earn the family extra money. That's where I got the term, nickname, rail splitter. I had all kinds of jobs. I didn't get along with my father all that great. We, it was okay, but not, not like it really should be. I don't, I didn't feel. Well, right at 20 years of age, I received a letter from a Mr. Denton in Indiana, requested that I take a flatboat full of goods down the Sagamon River to the Ohio and down the Mississippi. 
I have seen slaves before. They would march past our farm in leg irons. Most of them would come in from the northern states and they'd march them on south to the southern states. Yes, we even had slavery in the Maine. They weren't treated the same. They were treated better, but they were still slaves. They still worked for nothing, but they didn't get beat like the southern, like they did in the southern states. Maine was the only state in the Union that would let a Negro vote. Women weren't allowed to vote. I didn't think that was right. I wouldn't want to be a slave, so why would I own one? That always bothered me. Even from a young child. Well, I get up into Indiana. Mr. Denton didn't have a flatboat belt. I had to belt it for him. We got it loaded up with goods. Took it down the Sagamon River to the Ohio, down in the Mississippi. And that's when I really seen what slavery was all about, how they were beat and treated and put up on a platform and sold at auctions. There's a slave bell for you to look at. If you worked paid 75 cents a day, you were lucky. And some of them slaves were bringing as much as $1,200 a person. That would take several years for the return of your money. Well, I arrived back into Indiana. Mr. Denton wanted me to go in partnerships in the general store with him, so I did. I started out as clerk after the riverboat and went into business for him, with him. He passes away, leaves me the business. The business is already in debt. Real deep in debt. I have no idea how to run a business. wasn't long, I was bankrupt. While I was in business though, there was a gentleman passing through. He had a old broken down barrel full of goods, a wood bit handle. That's pretty well broke. I can't sell that junk. He did talked me into trading some other goods he needed. I kind of felt sorry for him. Old rusty old screwdriver. I can't sell that. Bucks! Wow. As much as I love to read, Robert Burns was my favorite poet. I love to read Shakespeare. I almost had Hamlet memorized, word for word. That's how many times I've read it. Books on English law. I'm going to have to study these. Governor appointed me postmaster. I was postmaster for a few years, failed with that. I was a surveyor. My father taught me how to survey. I piloted a riverboat for a while. But in all this time, I'm still studying law. I was an apprentice in an attorney's office. I started doing legal work. 
several prominent men thought I was doing such a great job, they signed a certificate granting me the privilege to practice law. So I am now a full-time attorney. Well, the State House is in Vandalia. Not a very big town. I practiced law for several years. I was approached, run for the state legislature. I yawned around about a full hour and finally agreed. Well, the senators would elect the legislatures at that time. Getting towards the end of the race, I didn't think I could do the job. I lost that election, and the reason I lost that election, I joined the Army. They made me captain of the troops right away. There was supposedly uprising, Indian rebellion. The Black Hawk War, we call it. No, we didn't see any bloodshed. Neither side. Yeah, we shoot at each other, way over their heads. They shoot at us with their bows, clear over our heads. We understood each other in a roundabout way, and we respected each other. No one got hurt. I served my term in the Army, run for state legislature. I win that election. My term is up. We have what we call a gentleman's agreement between a few people, since we're kind of appointed in a roundabout way. Okay, it's your turn to serve. I lost the following election. Well, election time come back up. My turn to serve again. Well, I served that term and several others. <coughs> well, while living in Springfield, we have four sons. Robert, Willie, Eddie, and Tad. Tad? Short for Tadpole. Real name, Thomas, named after my father. I was named after my grandfather. Eddie passes away in Springfield. That's not the first loss of my life. Before I courted Mary, Mary Todd, I really call her mother, I courted Ann Rutledge. Oh, I love that lady so. And she passes away on me. I went into a depression so deep, I laid into a bed for a good week. And my law partner finally come up to my room and just scolded me. I can't carry all the work on my own. I need your help. Get out of that bed and let's get some work done. So I did. Seen a nice young lady in Springfield walking down the street one day. Down 6th Street, actually. I asked another gentleman with me, I says, who is that lady over there? He says, well, that's Mary Todd. I says, where's she from? Oh, she's from Kentucky. I says, you need to introduce us sometime. So we met at, an, at a party, and he introduced me to Mary Todd. And I courted her for a while, and after a short while, I called it off. She always said, someday she'll be 
married to the President of the United States. Well, she wasn't courting me. She was courting Stephen Douglas. Very good friend of mine. We have a great difference of opinion, but he's still a good friend of mine. Well, Mary and I finally got married, had our four kids. Eddie passed away. A few gentlemen were after me to run for presidency. I decided to run. I was in the campaign on the campaign trail in '59. I was visiting a small town up here in northeast Kansas, up around the Atchison area. There was a young girl there I found out later on in life from New York, Albany, New York. Her name was Grace Bedell. That's what her name is. Well, I arrived back home and I had a letter from her. She wrote to me, Mr. Lincoln, I would think you'd be, look a lot more handsome if you would grow a beard. And if you do, I'll have my three brothers vote for you. That's why I decided to grow a beard. Well, I won the presidential election. I boarded the train at Baltimore, heading to Washington. Alan Pinkerton approaches me and says, Mr. Lincoln, there's going to be an attempt on your life. I have an army coat I want you to put on, and I have one more item. Now, I didn't have my beard yet. I was working at it. So, I donned a Scottish hat. Very few people recognized me. Well, come to find out, there was not an attempt on my life. But as I'm departing Springfield, I want to address the people of Springfield. And yes, I've always kept my speeches and notes in my hand. My friends, no one, not in my situation, uh, can appreciate my feelings of sadness at this parting, to this place, and to the kindness of these people. I owe everything. Here I have lived a quarter of a century and have passed from a young to an old man. Here my children have been born, and one is buried. I now leave, not knowing when or whether ever I may return, with a task before me greater than that which rests upon Washington. Without the assistance of that divine being who ever attended him, I cannot succeed. With that assistance, I cannot fail, testing in him who can go with me and remain with you and be everywhere for good. <coughs> Let us constantly hope that all will yet be well. To his care, commending you, as I hope in your prayers you will commend me. I bid you an affectionate farewell. Now, upon right, my arrival in Washington to the people's house, mother arrives, looks around. It's a disgrace. The people's house looks like this. The curtains are all torn. 
The furniture is all shredded, falling apart. There's basically nothing left of the carpeting. Hardly any cook cookware. Very few dishes and none of them match. Father, I'm going to New York City. So we can furnish this house and make it look like the people's house again. She boards a train, spends a week in New York City or so, comes home, several weeks pass, bits start to arrive. This goes on for a while. I've never seen any bills. She was hiding them on me. Did not want me to see them. I confronted her. She showed me the bills. I was furious. I kept calm. After all, I was bankrupt once before by several thousand dollars. I did repay all my bills. It took me several years, but I got them paid off. I figured if I did it once, I can do it again. She spent more than my first year's salary as president. Fort Sumner is attacked. Southern states wants a country of their own. No, we are one country. We keep this country united. We're not going to be two countries. One country! Southern states want slavery. I'm against it. Yes, there was slavery in the northern states, as I stated earlier, but it, they were treated different. But I still did not believe in it. But they still call them the free states. Well, so the war's twofold, slavery and state, and the states staying united. The war's going on. Willie well, passes away. Now I lose two sons. And all the young brave men that are losing lives out out there every day for freedom and liberty. Yes, the price of liberty is blood. General McClellan is in charge of my troops. He's not doing a very good job. Not very aggressive at all. I fire him. I hired General Hooker. Oh, that was a big mistake. He didn't like fighting at all. And for several other reasons. He didn't last long. I put McClellan back in command and well, things were just so-so and Chancellor, Wilson's Creek, Chattanooga, several other battles. We're losing darn near every one of them. The march gets up into Gettysburg, July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of 1863. Not the bloodiest battle of them. 50,000 men killed, wounded, or missing in action, not counting how many die later on of their wounds. Several thousand horses. A few gentlemen wanted to dedicate a portion of that battlefield. It's 
So the main speaker was supposed to get his speech ready. It took him several months. His speech was a little over two hours long. In November, Pennsylvania, cold, rainy, miserable, miserable day, people were coming weeks ahead of time. People in their homes would rent their beds out three shifts a day, two people per bed. The day of the dedication, you could look straight out there and you could not see the end of the people. That's how many people were up, come to that dedication. Reverend H. L. Bowers opens up the ceremony with prayers. Bands play. The main speaker gets up to the stage. He speaks for a little over two hours. After this, I didn't think anybody would stick around for my short speech. I wrote it several times because I just wasn't satisfied with the first several drafts. I arrive up on the stage. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But, in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will let them know, no longer remember what they say here. But it can never forget what they did here. It is for us a living, rather, to be, de to be de dedicated to the unfinished work which they have fought here thus far so nobly at best. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. That from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave their last full measure of devotion. That we hear highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from the earth. I hear questions in my head. What does this mean? This speech. Four score and seven years ago. 1863. A score is 20 years. 87 years prior. What happened in this country? Our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation. 87 years prior, we became a country. Our constitution. And what does it say in our constitution? 
it doesn't specify black, white, red, yellow. I hear no colors in there. All men are created equal. I always did believe that. Yes, I've been called a racist. Stephen Douglas accused me several times of being an abolitionist, which I never said I was. I never once said that. Mother and I get up, arrive at the breakfast table, Robert arrives, Pat arrives, we have breakfast. Robert informs Mother and me that he's joining the army. I begged and pleaded with him and so did Mother. We have lost two sons already. And with the war, so much lost there. I do not know if I could bear to lose another son. Mother is already having problems after losing two sons. I'm not a very good father. I'm not a good husband. I'm spending too much time with my cabinet members and at night, I'm spending all my time in the war room trying to figure out what to do when with my other generals in the war room. The war's over. Thank you. We can start rebuilding this country. We will hold no grudges against the South. Let's be united. Let's build this country back in one again. We need no more punishment. No, we're not going to hang the Union soldiers for treason. It would serve no purpose. April. I... Awake on a Friday morning, have an egg for breakfast, piece of bread with jam, a cup of coffee with mother, Robert, Tad. We have a few family discussions. I excuse myself, I have cabinet meetings. They lasted until approximately 1 o'clock. I already had tickets for Grover's Theater for that evening. I break for lunch, approximately 1. Mother informs me she would like to go to Forge Theater to see our American cousin. I says, well, I'll send a messenger out when I get back to the office and see if I can obtain some tickets. She says, well, I'd like to, Mr. and Mrs. Grant to go with us. I says, well, I'll check with uh, Mr. Grant, see if they can attend. During the meeting, I send a messenger out. He obtains four tickets. Mr. Grant declines the invitation. He says, we, we haven't seen our children in several years, and we would like to leave late this afternoon to see her own children. And I says, I can totally understand. Well, I sent a messenger out to tell Mary. And then Mother wanted to know if she could invite somebody else and said, and I says, that's fine. So after the meetings, nice spring day, we have a little something to eat. Mother and I go for a carriage ride 
The dogwood trees are in bloom, smell so nice. The lilacs are just lovely smell in the air. We rode by the shipyard, look at the worn, torn battleships, and seeing how much in need of repair they need to they need. We arrived back home. I still have a little bit more work to do before we go to the theater. So I go, go to my office. And while sitting in my office, Mother knocks on the door. She says, Father, we're late for the theater. I says, yes, Mother, I know. Let me finish signing these few papers here, and I'll be right along. Go on out to the carriage, and, and I'll be there shortly. So... I get that done. I meet her out at the carriage and we head out to Forge Theater and we arrive. We walk in late. The play's already started. It's in the uh, second act. We arrive at the presidential box. I'm supposed to have a soldier outside, standing guard. Man's played Hail to the Chief. People applauded. After that was all over, the four of us, we sit down, and the play resumes, and we're just sitting there, enjoying ourselves. of my life as President Lincoln. Any questions you would like to ask Mr. Lincoln? Come on, you don't have to be all shy. Yes. Um, so, you wear the hat, why? It was a style, and the band around the hat band, there's a reason for it. When you lose a loved one, women would sometimes wear a black dress as long as a year for mourning. Men would wear a black band around their arm. I myself and a lot of other men put a hat band around their hat. That is to remind me of our son, Eddie. And you also honestly kept papers up there, right? I mean, yes. Not, I mean, oh, he's yes. modeling that for you. He's pulling things out of his hat. That's yes, the that is. Did. And for memorization, no. I did not have any of my speeches memorized. None of them. You had a question. Um, how'd you get, like, how'd you get on the five dollar bill? That I honestly don't know. Who decided that? I have heard that, like, it's because, like, about, like, slavery and all that. that it could be. Slavery. I'd have to, re I'm going to be honest with you, I'd have to research that. I'm not going to tell you something I really can't answer right. Mr. L president Lincoln is trying to be modest here. He's generally ranked as the first or second greatest president of all time. The people on our currency that are uh, our finest, our finest people in history. So that's why it's the $5 bill rather than a different one. I don't know. But, I mean, he's there because he's held in such high regard. I'm going to hand you a $5 bill. You know what? You just sold me some stuff, but that $5 bill, that bank went out of business. Here's a good one. You want a $5 bill that might be just so-so? I nationalized the banks because at one time, the banks printed all their own money. This bank went, went broke. That's why this $5 bill is no good. This bank 
is doing good business. So if you have money in your your wallet from three different banks, I'm not taking his money. It's no good. That's why I nationalized the banks. I was for growth in this country. Pushing for railroads to transport goods, expand the nation. Help fund the Union Pacific Railroad. I set up a, a legal system to plot out land, sections, townships, ranges. You set that stone over there. No, that's my land. Your land should be over here. You're trespassing. That's why we do surveying. So we don't have land disputes. Yes, I settled a lot of cases in land disputes. Holidays. Every state had a day of Thanksgiving. Most of them were in November. Not the same day, most of them. I nationalized Thanksgiving as a national holiday. Got about eight or nine minutes or so. Okay. Any other questions? Come on. Yes. Um, you talked about the railroads and all that, like, so did you, like, do the ones, like, here in Kansas, too? Kansas was a newly formed state. The railroad was just coming into Kansas. Yes, I was promoting that. And river travel. Clean out the river so we can get river boats up and down the rivers on the major rivers. That's why Lewis and Clark done a lot of studying and Zebulon Pike learned the major river channels and stuff. And to learn this country, what's out here in the West? That's what they were sent out here for. Yes, yeah, any. Uh, how long had you been president before you were shot? I was, uh, took office in 61 and assassinated in 65. I, I was just barely into my second term. And there was about uh, four or five people actually hung over my assassination. Because they were plotting my assassination plus several others all in the same evening. Any other questions? Well, if that's the case, feel free to come up and look. And you can ask questions here. I have several books over here. You can look at and ask questions. And I will answer them to the best of my ability. For the young ladies, there's a book here with women in civil war. Some ladies would take a big rag and tie it around their chest, cut their hair short, so they could get right up on the front line and fight with a fellow soldier. There was women in the artillery, women that ran messages back and forth, nurses, Women served in all aspects of the war. They played a very important role in the war. Now, if you would like, feel free to come up. We made a lot of our own candles. 
That's a candle mold. Now these three are actually from the 1860s. Yes, please do not touch. So that's they, this is from a magazine called Harper's Weekly, and they they did etchings in order to have like photographs. They didn't have photographs, but that's like a carving, like an etching, and so those are really cool. But that's those are from the time period. The cabin is an actual model of the yes, your yes, cabin, right? Yes. One thing I should have pointed out also. You always see a president pose or people pose sideways. There's two reasons for that. And he probably knows the answer since he's a cameraman. It's easier to hold a straight face and not look at something direct. And the reason for that is it took several seconds to take a photo. And just one little movement, that photo was shot. It was no good. It'd be all blurry. Which is why the photos were essentially posed, too, for that yes. very reason. Mm -hmm. But that's, there's several historical sites. Mr. Lincoln's Historical Library is in Springfield, Illinois. But there's also the Boyhood Home site in Kentucky. Down in Hodgeville. So that's, that's they a have a replica site. home there. Uh, you go north to uh, the Sinking Springs Farm. Mother Nancy is actually buried there. They have a replica of the home there. So that's actually on land that you would have grown up on, right? Yes. Yes. I was approximately six years old when we left uh, Hodgdenville. Mm -hmm. Please don't play with that. The other paperwork and stuff is fine. Just some of these other older artifacts, please. Photo of Mary is an actual photo in an actual frame. And if you can bend over and look real close in each corner, you'll see something different. You gotta look real close. Something different in each corner, isn't there? That's a who? That's a Mary Todd. Oh, Mary Todd, okay. That's an actual photo of her. Yeah. I ran across that. Somebody didn't know what they had. <laughs> I had that checked out at the uh, uh, Lincoln Library. Paid two dollars and fifty cents. Yeah. Wow. You think it would be worth a lot? I don't remember what the current value is. And I still carry my Confederate money around. You can pass that around. That is real. So what, what time period is that from? That's from the 60s. From the 1860s. No? Yes. That's very impressive. And years ago on the coffins, they would make a shield and put it on top. That is a smaller version of the shield that was placed on Lincoln's coffin. I acquired that in Springfield, Illinois. Last time I was in Springfield, I walked into the State House. They sponsor a city in Japan. We had no clue what was going on. I was dressed just like you see me now. We walk in, there are all kinds of people in there. In the main chamber room, it was full of people. We walked clear around on one side. Only two chairs there, so we sit down. And the, MC all of a sudden looks up and he says, ladies and gentlemen, I'm becoming known to me. We have a special guest that has just arrived. President Lincoln, would you please rise? Mm -hmm. So I stood up and people turned around and they just stared. That's at the Lincoln Library? No, that was in the State House oh, in Springfield. House. Oh, okay. So they started their deal. 
and they had four girls about your age reading the Gettysburg Address in English, not reading it, memorized. Yeah. And they knew exactly what it meant. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Lincoln, for coming in today. We thank you. It greatly. Thank you.